Craniofacial dystrophy, a possible syndrome, part one, the abstract and the introduction. This article proposes a possible syndrome, craniofacial dystrophy, CFD, as one of the underlying causes of malocclusion and a range of other syndrome symptoms. These symptoms have seen a dramatic rise in the 20th century, lack a clear etiology, and are currently treated symptomatically. Over the last 10,000 years, there has been a progressive downswing in the anterior craniofacial structure, the ACS, possibly due to a combination of changes in the masticatory effort and the posture of the tongue and mandible. If the mouth is postured open and the muscles are weaker, the face lengthens. A downstream, reducing the cross-sectional area at the level of the oropharynx. This leads to less space for the tongue, the airway and the teeth, and is exacerbated by an increasingly evident suckling-like swallowing pattern. Changes in the shape of the ACS, the anterior craniofacial structure, affect the functions for which this structure is responsible, leading to a range of symptoms, including malocclusion. Certain Compensatory responses are possible to maintain these functions, primarily the airway. These vary between individuals, may be under genetic influence, and may also influence the anterocranial structure and dentition, at times creating vicious cycles. The introduction. It is projected that the next generation will live beyond 90 years and can also expect to be dentate having all their teeth for most of this. Now for this I chose a reference from the um, public records. I, I could have chosen any reference. I think it's a well accepted fact that uh, children are getting older, uh, will live longer. Few, however, will have an ideal occlusion for a significant period of this, lands, this lifespan. The general dental profession has achieved much by understanding the causes and pathology of decay and periodontal disease. However, despite great efforts, there is inadequate evidence for the orthodontic profession to draw con clear conclusions regarding the causes and pathology for malocclusion. What evidence we do have is limited by the lack of sound theories to test. It is clear that the environment can at times have a large influence on facial development and malocclusion. But there are few theories that explain these observed environmental effects. Well, there are two theories that I know of within orthodontic theory that attempt to explain the effects that we see from environmental influences. The other theories tend to accept a genetic origin for which no explanation is required one would imagine if it was genetic, you simply grew in that way. The two theories are Melvin Moss, the functional matrix, and Benny Solo, the dentoalveolar compensatory mechanism. Melvin Moss puts forward an interesting concept. He poses the idea that, um, like um, uh, microcephaly or hydrocephaly, these two different um, pathological situations lead to a functional response 
by the um, uh, skull that either increases or decreases the size of the skull. In the same respect, if you do not have an eye from a young age, the entire section of the face does not develop as well. And this creates the balances and these sections, these zones, are implicit in creating or defining the area of bone in that functional system. Melvin Moss's famous quote was, bones are stupid. Bones have no particular programming to know what to do. They have to be told what to do by the functioning environment around them. My concern with Melvin Moss's concept is that as soon as someone hangs their mouth open, it significantly changes the effect of that functional matrix, that area. And I don't think that his philosophy can cope with a mouth open posture. The next um, theory that's been put forward is by Benny Solo, a very, very nice gentleman. Um, his, his idea or his concept is simply putting down what most of us already understand within dentistry, that teeth sit and teeth and the bones and the alveolus, the bone around the tooth, tend to sit in a balance between the soft tissues on the outside, the lips and the cheeks, and the soft tissues on the inside, which is mainly the tongue. And these soft tissues determine the balance zone of where the teeth are. And he simply ordered and organized this concept into a paper that is um, very well referenced. Um, I think that um, contemporary orthodontics observes some of the rules laid down by um, the dental compensatory mechanism, the DCM, such as um, you know, a resistance to label advancement if we're going into the um, zone where the, tongue, the lip, bottom front lip occupies, um, uh, the canine width and expansion. You, know, you don't want to move the teeth out of their balance zone because in time the balance zone will re-establish the, itself and the expansion could be lost. Um, um, but little, um, there's little influence um, from Moss's functional matrix um, theorem within today's contemporary orthodontics. Um, continuing, we seem to have forgotten that our ancestors had complete and reasonably good occlusions from birth to death, as do nearly all vertebrates today. Um, when I say um, from birth to death, for most of our ancestors, I'm really drawing from the work of Coracini. I think that this is a fantastic book. We in orthodontics, or should I say the profession in orthodontics, openly admits that we don't know the cause or the etiology of malocclusion. I think it's important for anyone in a profession treating individuals, particularly children, to really understand the cause of the problem that we're treating. And this is not an easy read, but it's a fantastically informative book. It leaves very little debate or argument about how our ancestors were or what's causing malocclusion today in regards to the environment or the genetic question. I go on to say, as do nearly all dentate vertebrates today, Definitely the 5,400 species of mammal, but nearly all vertebrates with teeth have them in good alignment for their entire lives, with a few exceptions such as sharks and alligators or crocodiles. All of the teeth are in good alignment because they need to be for these animals to function. It seems to be only humans where, they, where there is this endemic change. And continuing. Opinion articles should act as a platform to make open, speculative suggestions, 
to find common ground with other professionals to either support or detract. This article proposes a possible pathology underlying malocclusion, crooked teeth, to act as a null hypothesis to be tested. To avoid preconceptions, a favorable anterior-rotating horizontal growth pattern will be referred to an upswing and the opposite as a downswing. So for the duration of this article, I don't want to confuse ourselves with some of the other concepts that have gone before, such as Bjork's rotational patterns. Bjork was revolutionary in the way he analyzed growth patterns, describing an anterior and a posterior growth pattern by using small metallic, what they referred to as implants, but since the advent of dental implants, we could call them bone markers, by placing bone markers into the jaws of growing individuals and taking x-rays I think every year it was Bjork's, I remember, he followed their actual growth. He saw actually how they grew. Now, it was fascinating research. It was very influential on me and much of the orthodontic profession. However, we have to remember he only had 21 individuals, all of whom were referred for orthodontic treatment, and seven of whom were clearly class 3 skeletal patterns. So we're looking at a very small, very biased group indeed. And the way Bjork interpreted them was interesting, but I want to change that slightly. And this also incorporates our understanding of our horizontal and vertical growth patterns. Understanding this to be a horizontal growth pattern, and this to be a vertical growth pattern. giving the two classic patterns within orthodontics. The horizontal growth pattern being easy to treat, works with functional appliances and all kinds of treatment. The vertical growth pattern tends to be very difficult to treat. Um, okay, thank you. So that's the end of part one.